Lord, Heavenly Father, speak to us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Don't need much more than that in prayer, do you? You're going to listen to, not Frank's phone, but you're going to listen to uh, some Bible verses being read to you by three of us. See if you can guess the running theme. God might kill me, but I have no other hope. I'm going to argue my case with him. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come to those who are treacherous without cause. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Saviour and Lord. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. May all who fear you find in me a cause for joy. For I have put my hope in your word. I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I'm counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. No, the Lord's delight is in those who fear him, those who put their hope in his unfailing love. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but the dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Don't envy sinners, but always continue to fear the Lord. You will be rewarded for this. Your hope will not be disappointed. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope. The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We are given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. 
To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as, our breast, as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. A round of applause, please, for Timmy and Liz. So, anybody get the one word theme that was running through all those Bible verses? Hope. Well done. Give yourself a round of applause. Our current vision statement at the moment is reclaiming ground and restoring. Which is now, as you will see, I hope, on the front poster, yes? Bit eye-catching, isn't it? We get lots of people mention it. it's eye-catching. I had to simply pull up in their van and go, wow, yeah, that's good. See? Pastor David was driving in his van, and no, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I am joking, I am joking. But then, what is hope? We talk about it. We'll say the word, but do we know it actually what it is? What does it look like? With the person next to you, or if you've got three of you in a row, discuss. Go. And move if you're on your own. Okay, great to see energetic conversation. Now discuss this first for me and then I would just like a little bit of feedback on this one. This is the verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Romans 8, 28, if you want to look it up, I'll re-repeat it and then you need to discuss what does it actually mean. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Okay, so two or three, and I'm not breaking that rule like I did last week, two or three, and we'd like to just give a sort of what they think that verse means. Okay, so um, we concluded that what this verse means is that in all things, God has a purpose and a plan. And once we can just put our trust in him, we know that ultimately God's purpose will be a good one and his plans for us are good. So all things will work together for good in the end. In the end. Okay, thank you. I also think it means that we don't need to depend on ourselves. We need to depend on God 
to help us through all things. Thank you, Dennis. One more person. Don't have to take you, it's fine. Okay. In the end, rely upon God. Hope in the end. I hear the words, and I'm not denying what you said, and I hear it a lot of times. Well, that verse gets used a lot when you're going through trauma right now. And normally it gets used a lot when it's to say, it's all right, God's going to sort it out tomorrow. That's effectively what is heard when you read that verse. Hope, I would suggest for some of us, is to hope for God to give us a nice easy day today. He'll answer your problems today. Financial, emotional, health, relationships. Get rid of that nasty neighbour. That nasty work colleague. Removing your addiction. I have no idea why I wrote this, but I felt I had to. If this is what you hope for, if this is what your hope rides on, it's not what I would consider to be wholeheartedly sorting it tomorrow. And I think deep down for a lot of us, that's how we sit. When we read about hope, we read about working out the plans for the good of us, actually what we're saying is everything's sorted now. Restoring hope actually means restoring a well-balanced life for me now. That everything is fine now. Am I wrong? I think it's born out of some of our credit card ideals. Want it? Can't wait for it? Can't be bothered to save for it? I'll pay for it now. Here's my credit card. Ah, just stick it on the credit card. And it's that sort of instantness that we expect God to do when there is things going on in our life. Come on, God, just whip out your credit card. Go on, swipe it. <laughs> you laugh, but that is a lot of our, not quite literally expecting God to swipe out a credit card, but the point is he swiped out his son. And so therefore we think, well, then God will deal with it instantly right now because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Our hope is based on having a nice, easy lifestyle. If my life is nicely balanced, I have hope. That is not the correct biblical concept of hope. You will be not surprised to hear me say. I would love it if everything was sorted out here and now today. But that verse in Romans 8 continues with this. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and having chosen them he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Most of us probably know it a bit better these days from the NIV. This would be the only time I probably want to quote the NIV. It's an in-joke between me and somebody else. 
But for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Most of us know that way of doing it. It means that each, that God has called each and every one of us to a purpose. Amen? Amen. I did, there was at one point this morning, I decided, Denzel, would you like my sermon? Because she started talking all about that. Do you know what your purpose is? Do you know what your purpose is? Be transformed into the likeness of Christ. To be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Yeah, I did just say it. But when I ask you, what is your purpose? If I hadn't read that verse, I'll lay 101, it would be to do God's will. To do something for God. Yes? Your purpose, your hope, is that you will be transformed into his likeness. I know sometimes that struggles, especially when I'm talking about in the male character. We're talking about his character and his abilities, not his gender. So, sisters in the house, don't panic. You're not going to get deeper voices. You've been called and justified. Notice the past tense. We keep banging on about this every week. This seems to be a revolving theme for God at the moment in this church, to keep telling you today that you are saints. You are called and justified. Now, I would like to get out of that message onto something else. But I think what the problem is is that God is saying, my people are still not getting it. So if you want us to do a hellfire and brimstone type sermon until you get it, that's fine. But God doesn't want that. He wants to do a love and you are mine type sermon. Called and justified. Past tense. I.e. now. Got it? And you're being conformed to his likeness now. To bring him in, you, into glory. Now. Are we getting the now bit? It's okay. Half an hour, you can glory in the sunshine. You are being transformed now. Doesn't feel like it, but you are. More and more like Jesus on a daily basis. Do do you understand that? Do, do, Do you revel in that? The transformation is a moral one, initially. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. You're being changed now. If you should see the sea of faces I'm looking at now, You're being changed now. There should be lots of, wow. Yeah, hallelujahs, amens. You're being changed now into his glorious image. There is a moral transformation going on with you. You are changing. For want of a better phrasing, you are noticing when you are not doing something God wants you to do, yes? And you're also noticing when you are doing something that God wants you to do, yes? That's the moral transformation going on. I remember years ago, years ago, uh, uh, in this church, 15 years ago, something like that, and uh, having to pray with someone who hadn't long been a Christian, and they had decided that um, they clearly are more bad now than prior to becoming a Christian. They're doing more wrong things now prior to becoming a Christian. And we sat there and I said, why do you think that? Well, I'm aware of all the things that I'm doing wrong. I said, actually, no, that means the Holy Spirit's working on you. Actually, it means you're more of a Christian. You're being more transformed into the Christ-like image. 
But the issue is, we then focus on the bad things we're doing and forget all the great things we're doing. My testimony this morning, I could have reflected on the fact that, well, I just wanted to sit in the chair, enjoy the sunshine, haggling with people. By the way, loved every second of it. I had forgotten what it was like. And when you get people from different nationalities turning up, have different styles of haggling. There's at one point I decided to leave Joy to Joy's brilliant at it as well, by the way. Woo! I ain't never gonna haggle with her again. <laughs> It'd just be yes, love. But there was one point she was haggling with a gentleman who came in uh, 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 and uh, uh, I'm just going to say this because he was. he was. He was from African con continent. I don't know where from exactly. But he started haggling with Joy over a 50p. <laughs> Which is fine. That was cool. But they were just stolen. But what the funny thing, I just carried on sitting there. And after a while, he looked at me and he said, and you're not going to say anything? <laughs> no. At which point he said, do you know, back home, he said, we'll get the elders around you. And he was, he was having a laugh and a giggle. That was the point. <laughs> It was, it was very funny because he was obviously having a laugh with me, we was having a laugh with him, and it was a funny time. But I wanted to sit there and just enjoy. But God said, no, you know you've got to be consciously aware of people around you, which I was partly, and I was hoping we could interact with. But I didn't quite expect the whole thing that happened for about a few hours that it did. Colossians 3, 9 to 10 says this, For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Your old nature is dead and gone. Do I get a bit of an amen? amen. Do you believe it? Yes. Do you really believe it? Yes. No, do you really, really believe it? Okay, do you live your daily life believing it? Yes. Oh, this is a lot less yeses then. <laughs> your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds are gone. Be renewed as you learn to know your creator, it says. Not know about him. Know him. Relationship. When you are in that relationship, you learn something new about your creator. Yes? In communication daily basis. I learned something new about joy yesterday. About the bartering. And the way she was, yeah. Yeah, church, try it. Guaranteed you lose. But I learned something new, but I was in the relationship by being in her presence and watching and observing her, seeing what she was up to. Sat there as a really proud husband, thinking she can do this on her own now. I can stay at home. I don't have to get up at 5.30 in the morning. Goodness me. But you learn in the relationship with God, you are going to be more and more transformed. He does the transformation. It's why you're there. I, didn't, I just picked up from joy what she's doing. I got transformed about my wife because of just watching and observing what she was up to. Do you see the point? Same thing with God, you get transformed in the relationship by seeing what he's up to. And you're there with him in the midst of it. That's the moral transformation that takes place. You don't change you, God changes you as you develop the relationship. Your old self is dead. It's us that keep, keep reviving it. When baptised, you sunk in that wall, you died to your old self and you became a new creation. Yes, on the outside you looked exactly the same. As you get older, you discover you do change a little bit. In my case, a lot less hairs. And a very grey streak here if I let it grow too long. But inside, there is a transformation, a moral transformation going on because of the relationship with God. And then, in this other part of hope, there is an end time transformation. End time, at the end of time, or as Ray put it, ultimately. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, 
so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Philippians 3, 20, 21 says this, but we are citizens of heaven. Is anybody getting hot in here? Fresh air. By the way, that's the only way to open that door. Everybody mentions that. It's the only way to open that door. You have to kick the bar. It's too stiff. But we are citizens of heaven. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our saviour. Ah, say that again. He will take our weak mortal bodies, your weak mortal body, and change them into his, sorry, change them into glorious bodies like his own. Using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Including noisy motorbikes. Where do you think you're going to end up when this mortal shell of yours goes? What do you think is going to happen? Where do you think you'll end up at the end of time? And for some of those that were with me on Thursday evening, you do not put your hand up or I will ignore you. Not a trick question. Say that again, Carol, please. At the end of time? In heaven with God. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Heaven again, okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I know you was asking the question. I'm just saying. I will answer the question in a moment, Bethel. Are you talking about our present body or the new no, body? at the end of time. Well, we'll be with Christ. Where? Forever. Well, eternity. That's a, that's, that's a time frame. <laughs> Where? <laughs> I ain't got a clue. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Well done for the honest answer, Dennis. Here. 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 On a new earth. On a new earth. Yeah. It won't be heaven at the end of time. It will be here. You're not going to sit in heaven on white fluffy clouds for the whole of eternity. That's not going to be possible. This concept of that we will... Anyway, let me go through the passage first. Revelation 20, 11 to 15 says this. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as records in the books. The sea gave up its dead and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. But i just explain something before I carry on. Sometimes read that when it says according to their deeds. We assume according to the works we have done. It is not. The deeds are what choice did you make? Did you choose to follow Christ or not? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully beautifully dressed for her husband. See, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. 
and the sea was also gone. By the way, sea, don't forget, a lot of revelation is actually imagery in a lot of ways. When it says about the sea disappearing, it means because sea meant chaos and evil. That's where it resided. And clearly you're not going to have chaos and evil residing in the ultimate perfectness of God's kingdom. Yes? So it appears, according to Revelation, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Earth and heaven are going to sort of meet together. Currently, heaven and earth are right now together. Heaven is not somewhere up there. Kingdom of heaven is actually here. The problem is it's almost like a dividing wall that needs shattering and breaking completely so it can completely fill. To try and get this imagery in your head again. Do you remember what I said last week about imagining? It's that sort of thing you need to do just a little bit. So there's clearly meant to be a new earth. If there's going to be a new earth, who's going to live on it? We are. Let me point out something to you. It makes it very clear that we're going to have resurrection bodies, yes? Resurrection bodies, yes? You're all going to get new bodies. Physical bodies are not going to be just in heaven. They're to be here. God will be with his people. The heaven and the earth coming together is God saying he's coming to dwell completely and wholeheartedly with his people. There is going to be no separation. Do you get the point? That's what it means when we say we're going to be in God's presence. That does not mean up in heaven at the end of time. It means that it's going to be almost like the Garden of Eden is meant to be portraying this concept of walking around the garden. By the way, don't get away with the fact that you're just going to be tending your, your lawn and your flower beds. But you're... Sorry, Dorothy, it's not quite... You, you might get that job, you never know. You probably will do. You're not going to be just tending in the garden, walking around, but God is going to be there all the time. That imagery of the fact that we are just going to be in God's presence all the time with him. He's not going to be some, what we conceptualise him, some spirit somewhere up in the thing. Sky, we're getting, he's actually going to be here with us, surrounding us, in us, talking to us. You can almost have this tangible concept of actually walking up and going, not quite in a casual manner, but with that sense of lordship that you can actually be with God wholeheartedly. That love is just going to envelop you completely. That's why there's going to be no more tears, no more pain. Isn't that something to hope for? That's what it means. Somebody once said, to, uh, yeah, I've had a few times over the years, people say, oh, no, this is hell where we're living now on this planet. I said, no, it's not. Because God is still working on this planet, so it can't be hell. Because God really wasn't here, then it would be hell. The reason there's love and things, good things going on is because God's here. But imagine that perfectly. It states in Revelation that the old has gone. In Christ, you've been made new. At the resurrection day, you will be completely new and the earth will be completely new. How can we make sense of that? Well, let's look at it talks about in those Corinthian verses about Jesus' body being the first fruits of the resurrection body. Yes. Well, here's the rub. What happened to the old body in the tomb? What happened to the old body? It, no, it was used for the resurrection body. Do you get the point? They didn't just sweep the, two, the old body out and cast it out, and God just went, and new body. He used the old body as the building blocks. That's why Jesus was able to say, look at the marks on my hands, which weren't marks of shame anymore, but actually were marks of victory. That's why it says in Revelation that the old and the new, the old earth and the old heaven are gone. And it doesn't mean they disappeared and went out. It means that actually God reused what was already here. In Genesis, it says that when he looked at his creation, he said it was very good. 
Well, it's not going to wipe out completely and obliterate that what was already good. Just because we've corrupted it, he's going to reuse it, reshape it. You don't if you've got a plant. Hey, Dorothy, now I'm not good at this, but let's go for it, shall we, because you're sitting there. If you've got a rose plant that is sort of not doing greatly, but it's got a few offshoots that are just budding and the dead bits, what do you do? Don't throw the whole plant away, do you? No, I prune it and feed it. You prune it and feed it. I learned a little bit of gardening from my wife. Therefore, your body is going to be used for the resurrection body. Who thought I can just abuse my body because God's going to get rid of it anyway? <laughs> yeah, I used to think like that, and I don't know. Um, but our bodies decay. So yes, that's correct, and we'll come to that in a moment. Our bodies do decay at the moment. At the moment, they're decaying. Quite frankly, this earth, quite frankly, is decaying. So if our bodies are used for, if Jesus' body was used for his resurrection body, our body is going to be used for a resurrection body, yes? I'm not talking about cremation and burying here, by the way. If our God can do all things, he can collect anybody's ashes up together and recreate them, yes? Right, okay, good. Just make sure we get that clarified, but people start panicking about cremation. You know, because the whole argument, people say, oh no, you should be buried. What happens if you're Christians in a burning fire and they get completely obliterated in the burning fire? What are they going to do then? Yeah, exactly, all right? Let, let's go with the fact that our Lord can do anything. anything and all things. But not always instantly. You're not going to sort out your problems this afternoon. So he's going to use the old earth for the new earth. He's going to sort of recreate it, regenerate it. Does that make you hopeful? Yes. Does that make you work towards the fact this is amazing? Yeah? I just because you know you're going to have things to do in the after afterlife I said you're not going to be sitting around just doing nothing it's not going to be sitting on lounging beds but you're going to relish in it in Genesis when they finally had corrupted it what did he say you're going to have to toil with the land prior to that they didn't working the land was enjoyable you didn't have hard ground to have to spade into, Dorothy. It was a relish. All the gifts you have, the talents you have now, the things you really enjoy, you might well end up being that your vocation, something you do. I'm going to be out of a job. <laughs> Nobody's going to be preaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ anymore, are they? <laughs> There's, cars are not going to exist. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, part of this is a bit of laughter, but the idea is to actually understand the something. C.S. Lewis put it really well in The Great Divorce. Our bodies will be more real, more solid, more substantial. There's going to be something more about us. We look at creation, we think how wonderfully coloured. Could you imagine if it was perfect and there was no marring of sin? The colours, I reckon, will be more vibrant. C.S. Lewis put this, and I think it's great. I think, actually, everything will be more colourful, more vibrant. Things are going to taste more wonderful. Who likes steak? Yeah. I think it's going to really taste marvellous. Who likes wine? Yeah. Sorry, you can admit if you drink it. It's fine. It's not a problem. <laughs> I think it's going to be a deeper flavour. You know, I can go on forever. The water is going to be... It's that sort of thing. Your bodies are going to be more real. If you've never read C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce, do enjoy the imagery behind it. Don't agree with everything in the book, but some of that imagery really makes you think, wow. There is something for us to live more. This earth will be more. People sort of say, of all the Christians that have died, how is God, is this planet going to be big enough? We're talking about God. Come on. He knows what he's doing. And that's the hope we look forward to, is the resurrection life. Do you look forward to it in that way? Do you look forward to the resurrection of hope? Do you with me? 
try and ask this question slightly a different way. How does this hope affect your daily living? See, do you get angry people who have cut you up on the roundabout and you hoot the horn? How does this hope affect your daily living? Discuss between yourselves. Okay. No, I didn't give you very long. But I'm sure you want to get out in the sunshine in five minutes. <laughs> no, some of us are stuck here today. We're clearing out two rooms. Church premises management team are clearing out two rooms today. Talk about chose the wrong day to do it. So, how should this hope affect your daily living? I think that if we let this world get us down, we, we won't have anything to hope for. But if we hope for what we do not see, then we know that one day we will see it. Okay. Thank you. Does that drive your daily life? It does. Give In all circumstances? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. We kind of said it was a mixed bag because sometimes you, you know, you know, and there's this, you know, you, there's a situation and you think, yeah, it doesn't matter because, you know, we've got that hope. And other times there's something that's going on and it's so drastic and so painful that you can't always feel that hope and you don't understand why God's not intervening or you're still in that place where you want it sorted Yeah, today. absolutely. I was glad somebody was going to be really honest. I was going to work towards that if we hadn't got there in the end. Anybody else? Um, it just makes us uh, aware of the fact as well that so we have a responsibility to people all around us who are perhaps, uh, some who are Christians, wandering away from their faith because can't understand why what God's doing and they feel that uh, there's no need to hope anymore and uh, we've not just got to remain steadfast ourselves, we need to ensure that we're encouraging other people to hold on as well. Thank you. I think also difficult situations in our everyday life should not be as significant as we, we make it out to be. We should uh, think this is nothing. Although, of course, we are, we are only human, we'll see it as a big issue. But we should think that this is nothing compared to the glorify, <laughs> glory I'm going to get. To yeah, you. I really agree with you, Bethany. There is, there is some element, sometimes we need to look at something in light of eternity. But I do also agree that sometimes things can just be so consuming and so overwhelming, it is difficult to see the hope. I think, you know, we're, we're still human, although we have that hope, and God made us with emotions. Um, um, you know, and he says, on that day, he's going to dry all, all, all the tears, on that day. So that's, we do, it doesn't negate our, our humanness. The Bible says to rejoice with those who rejoice, cry and mourn with those who are mourning. So those are all part of being human, just because we have that hope uh, in front of us that should help to ameliorate it a bit, you know, comfort us. It gives us comfort, but we're still going to feel. Otherwise, we'll be psychopaths, won't we? <laughs> Doesn't Paul say somewhere that he considers the suffering that we now have a nothing, uh, going to be nothing compared to what we're going to have in the future glory? Absolutely. He was talking to the persecuted church who were really suffering. And he said, actually, I don't consider these sufferings anything compared to the glory, the future glory that is awaiting. It is hard. The, I agree, we, we are emotional beings. And by the way, you're not going to become unemotional beings in your resurrection body. Just thought you'd like to know that. You still have them. Yeah. 
And it's very easy to sort of say, wow, you shouldn't be crying about this and, and dismissing it in light of eternity. There are some things I, I do feel that we do tend to hang on to and we, um, we really should just think this is just a momentary moment. This is an, a mo momentary feeling or whatever else and this will soon pass in the scheme of eternity. But I would suggest, as I said right at the beginning, that verse that is used, that, uh, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and according to his good purpose, that is asking God to sort something out today. And when he doesn't, we start losing that sense of hope. Because he hasn't sorted it now, we start losing that sense of hope in him. What have I done wrong today, Lord, then? And God always says, but you actually have got to look to the future as well. You have to hold your future hope in line and in balance with what's going on today. You are justified when? No. You're justified when? No, no. You're justified when? Now, you have a glory now. You have a future hope. God calls you his child. Why is the Cypriot not shouting just as loudly? Thank you very much, Mike. Goodness me. You don't come over and just do nothing, you know. Again, you're not going to sit in heaven on fluffy white clouds, Martin. But the point is, it's all justified now, but we don't live like that. The minute trouble comes our way, we think either I've done something really wrong, which you might have done, you might have screwed up. But it doesn't mean God's going to abandon you in the process. He might teach you a heck of a lot of lessons and transform you into his likeness through it. But you're justified now, and that's the hope you should be having. And we should treat our planet in the same vein. Creation care. It's taken me years to get to this point. I'm so good at not recycling. I know. I've learned. Don't panic. I've been transformed a bit more. But the point is that we actually need to walk on this planet, recognise we are being transformed into his likeness. That is the hope that we have. When trouble comes our way, we recognise that actually it is awful, painful, whatever else. I'm not denying any of that. You're not going to get from me, if you're coming from me, Pastor, I'll just sort it out in turn until you've got hope. You're not going to get that. You're going to walk up, have us walking alongside you. But we recognise in that we have to say sometimes there is hope. You have to have hope in what is coming in the future, which is your resurrection body, living in the total presence of God. Don't walk into work tomorrow, or college, or whatever you're doing tomorrow. Walk in with this sense of... <laughs> walk in with a sense of, actually, do you know something? God is with me right now. I'm justified. I'm glorified. I have got a hope coming anyway, and I've got a future glory coming. This really is moment lightery. God's got things sorted. I may not know about it right now, but he's got it sorted. And it might be a painful run. I'm not denying that. But live in that hope. Don't do what I do every month. No, I'm joking. <laughs> That's about Friday afternoon. No, I'm, just... I'm having a laugh. But even there's times I do come in here thinking, right, administration work. Here we go. Two hours of paperwork. <sighs> Hope. Angels, come and sort. Oh, rats. No. Right, I've got to do it then. But, you know, it's that hope. Hope should be driving some of our thinking and... Mainly our thinking. Doesn't always drive, and that drives our emotions. Shouldn't allow the emotions to always override some of your straightforward thinking. That's why we read all those verses out. Because, do you know, there is more. We could have gone on virtually for the whole 55 minutes pulling out sermons on, uh, verses on hope and being justified and glorified. Hope. 
Hope is not on a credit card. It is on the promises of God. Take you a moment just to reflect. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Lord, I pray for all of us, this becomes a living reality. We know ultimately, Lord, that we don't quite can't work out exactly what is going to happen at the end of times, exactly how us living on this new earth with the new heaven is actually going to really look like. We know, Lord, it is going to be so much better than what it is today. I ask, Lord, you will help us be people who live in that hope, people who live in the fact that we are called, people who live in the fact that we are justified, people who live in the fact that we know we will be glorified and be with you in your presence. And help us be people who are out there telling people of this hope as we live it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.